Good. Uh, thank you, Tenma. Uh, well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here in Rio for this uh, conference. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, speak on some aspects of optimal taxation and wealth uh, redistribution. Uh, this is work uh, carried out jointly with uh, uh, Bernard uh, uh, Meister. Uh, <coughs> let me begin with a few generalities. Uh, so, in most uh, modern societies, it's, it's accepted that some element of wealth uh, redistribution is required. And uh, generally, although... No, Uh, I realize that, uh, but I said in most modern societies, it's accepted that some element of wealth distribution is required, which is true. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. Some societies aren't as modern as they think they are, and uh, that's a problem. Yeah. No, I admit, the issue in the... Uh, but, uh, Well, I think they're, they're Maybe we should let the speaker yes, start yes. the presentation and then well, these, follow up with questions. These are all good points, and if anybody else would care to give the presentation, they're welcome to, of course. But, uh, but uh, uh, so generally, this involves taking from the rich and giving to uh, the poor in one way or another. And even in societies like the United States, there is an element of redistribution of wealth to the poor. Um, it's also accepted that taxation is necessary, uh, <clears throat> but it's not generally obvious, it's not at all obvious really what the optimal scheme of wealth uh, redistribution uh, should be or what the optimal taxation policy uh, uh, should be. And of course there's a huge uh, debate on this kind of issue that's been going on for uh, uh, many uh, centuries. So we won't pretend to solve uh, the issues here. Uh, the problem is complicated by the fact that part of or even much of taxation is in effect a form of wealth redistribution. For example, at least in European societies, uh, taxing the uh, rich uh, to pay for various social services uh, provided for the uh, uh, less uh, well off. Uh, in fact, most uh, wealth redistribution uh, uh, in uh, uh, civilized societies takes place this way, apart from the activities, let's say, of charitable organizations and philanth philanthropists, or at the other extreme, political revolutions or uh, or, or criminals. Well, well, we can ask, is there an objective basis for which one can uh, determine optimal levels of wealth redistribution and taxation? So this is clearly an important issue. Uh, and it should be evident that it's a, it's a very political issue and one doesn't expect a completely objective uh, uh, answer. Uh, but, uh, but at least we can try. And uh, so we'll put forward some ideas here. Uh, so the particular uh, line that I'm going to take is what you might call a thermodynamic approach because it's based in part on some ideas that come from classical theory of uh, uh, thermodynamics. So more precisely, uh, it's based on some precise mathematical uh, parallels arising between the theory of finance and classical uh, thermodynamics. Uh, so to proceed with this, I think it'll make sense first to describe the relevant notions in the language of finance and economics. Uh, since these will be, of course, familiar to the audience. And it's only when uh, the meaning gets clear in this context that then I'll go back and retrace the ideas uh, in, uh, in physical uh, terms. Uh, this is something that I'm comfortable with myself because my background is uh, as a physicist, at least a long time ago, uh, but it's not something that everybody will be familiar with, and it's interesting to see uh, uh, the, the parallels. Uh, so what I'm proposing can be regarded as a kind of econophysics, but it's worth keeping in mind that uh, the mathematics is going to be exact, and there are no claims that actual physical processes are at work in financial markets, more that there is a broad sort of parallel of ideas uh, in the two situations, and one can sort of transfer the ideas from one sector uh, to the other. Uh, so the approach is interesting from this point of view, since not only do the physical ideas suggest uh, a few new ways of looking at problems in economics and finance, but the reverse is true as well and we're able to suggest new ways of thinking about the theory of uh, heat engines. Uh, but hopefully not everything that I'm going to say is just hot air. <laughs> well, <coughs> uh, we'll keep matters very uh, simple. So the mathematics in particular will all be uh, uh, elementary. Um, 
So uh, we're going to suppose the existence of a kind of an ideal society. Uh, I won't attempt to list all of the axioms, but they'll be uh, clear enough where the idealizations are coming into play. And we'll assume that there are uh, two classes of earners or workers. Uh, so the uh, high earners make an income X, and the low earners make an income Y. Uh, X is greater than Y. And we'll assume that uh, all of the workers are characterized by the same uh, utility function. Now, one can immediately think of many uh, generalizations. Perhaps they have different utility functions. Maybe one doesn't even want to use a utility function, and so on and so forth. But as I say, I'll try to keep matters fairly uh, simple uh, without uh, trying to generalize on the spot. Uh, but in particular, uh, to be uh, sort of precise in a mathematical sense, we'll assume that U is a so-called standard utility function. So this means it uh, has continuous second derivatives. It's increasing. Uh, it's uh, concave. Second derivative is negative. And then we'll assume that the uh, the limit of the marginal utility as x goes to infinity vanishes, and the limit of the marginal utility as x goes to zero is uh, infinite. And so, uh, so these properties together ensure that the, as is well known, that the inverse uh, marginal utility function uh, exists uh, for all values of, of x. And we'll make use of this as we uh, go along. So some standard uh, utility functions are logarithmic utility, where u of x is log of x. And, and a slightly more exotic example, which is used a lot, is power utility for some index p. And p is some number that is uh, strictly less than uh, 1. And we uh, exclude uh, uh, 0. Uh, and then u of x is given by uh, 1 over p times x to, to the power of p for positive uh, values of, uh, of x. So. Uh, proceeding now with the example we have in mind, uh, we'll look at the case where there are just two uh, workers. Uh, so the total income is, let's say, x plus y, and then the total utility is u of x plus uh, u of y. Uh, so, uh, so here for simplicity, we're assuming that utility is additive uh, uh, amongst the workers. Now this is uh, ignoring certain aspects of how ideal societies uh, might operate in practice, where there would be elements of cooperation and so forth. Uh, but we'll leave that for later. I mean, Fisher Black, for example, was a great uh, critic of the assumption of additive uh, utility uh, uh, in economics. Uh, but we're going to make that assumption uh, for simplicity uh, here. So now we can consider wealth uh, redistribution. Uh, here, we're, since it's such a simple model, wealth redistribution, income redistribution amount to the same thing. Uh, so the simplest example occurs when worker one gives half of his income to worker two, and worker two gives half of his income to uh, worker one. Uh, and then you can see that this means that the two incomes are equalized, and they each take the value one half of uh, x plus uh, y. Uh, now, so we have each worker getting one half of x plus y. So now we can invoke the concavity of the utility function. And this implies for any uh, distribution, so any positive values of alpha and beta, such that alpha beta is equal to 1, then the utility of, of alpha of x plus beta y is greater than the uh, alpha times the utility of x plus beta times the utility of y. Uh, so it follows that in the case of two workers, the total utility after wealth redistribution, so if you like, the total utility of society after wealth redistribution is greater than the total utility before the wealth uh, redistribution. So in our particular case, uh, we see that uh, twice the utility of one half of x plus y is greater than the sum of the two utilities at x uh, and y. And if you can picture the graph of the concave uh, function for the uh, utility, uh, then you can easily see uh, geometrically uh, that this is uh, uh, the case. So uh, this fundamental fact you can regard as the essence of the utilitarian justification for social policies of wealth uh, redistribution. One can put it in fancier forms and extend it to more uh, uh, sort of richer examples, uh, but uh, it amounts in one way or another uh, to an argument uh, of this type. Uh, yes? Well, if we, if, 
yes. Well, I'm, at the moment, I'm looking at a simple example, and the, 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 the example contains all the relevant principles. If you want to make a distinction, which is, of course, appropriate between wealth uh, and income, then, of course, one has to go back and consider uh, uh, the, the details, and I would claim that the principles still apply, but, uh, I've, but that's not really the, the important point. You know, if, once you get the principles, then you can apply it to special situations where you have different types of wealth and different classes of uh, agents in society uh, and so on. Uh, so, um, one can one can ask, is it really necessary to equalize the wealth? Uh, well, one can easily see that wealth equalization maximizes the total utility. I did it by fiat in the previous example. Uh, uh, what's involved is just a very simple argument. Uh, suppose you consider some wealth redistribution where the original uh, incomes are X and Y, and then we have new incomes R and S, such that the total income R and S is equal to X plus Y. Uh, then the total new utility is u of r plus u of s, and that's u of r plus u of x uh, plus y minus r. And then you, uh, for a maximum, you differentiate that with respect to r, and then you get this condition on the marginal uh, utilities. But remember, the marginal utility is invertible under our, our assumptions, so as a consequence, this implies that r is equal to x plus uh, y minus r, and thus r is equal to 1 half x plus y, and then similarly for s, and then that gets us back to the example that we constructed by fiat a, a moment ago. Uh, so equalization, in fact, gives optimal uh, uh, utility. Now, in, in reality, of course, it's more complicated than that. If you try to uh, totally equalize the wealth, then the richer people will, will grumble, and the poorer people will become greedy, and various complications can develop. Uh, so in reality, there are various compromises. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, the principle remains that if if you just have simple utility and if it's additive and that's that, uh, then the optimal utility is obtained by uh, wealth uh, equalization. Now we come on to the interesting problem of, of taxation. So far we've just called about wealth redistribution. Uh, but we see that by redistributing the wealth, we increase the overall utility. So this suggests uh, the idea of taking away uh, some of the wealth in the form of, of tax. Uh, so this would reduce the overall utility, but it would still uh, leave it higher than the original overall utility. So the idea is you redistribute wealth, that increases utility, but then you take some of that wealth away uh, in the form of tax, and the, that decreases uh, the utility again, but not necessarily all the way down to uh, what its uh, original uh, level was. So that way you can take some tax while at the same time increasing overall uh, uh, utility. And then the, the tax is put to uh, uh, the purpose of, uh, of running the government or uh, paying off the leaders or uh, something to this effect. Uh, now, the maximum tax can be obtained uh, if we take away sufficient wealth uh, to ensure that the total utility after the redistribution is equal to the original utility before the redistribution. Uh, so the idea is that the total wealth is redistributed into two equal parts. Uh, each of value R for the two workers, uh, plus a tax uh, uh, for the um, uh, uh, government. Uh, so that means we said X plus uh, Y is equal to twice R. R is the amount distributed to the two workers, and then T is uh, uh, the tax. So you can choose R in such a way that the total utility obtained by the two workers after the redistribution is the same as the uh, original uh, uh, utility before uh, redistribution. Uh, so that's to say we require that R is given by twice U of R is equal to U of X plus U of Y. So if you use the standard utility function, then for a given X and given Y, uh, you can show that there exists a unique value of R uh, satisfying this conditions. This follows from the uh, concavity of the uh, utility function and the other assumptions uh, uh, that we've made. Uh, so one can always achieve some wealth redistribution that will uh, generate a tax. And, uh, and by this particular scheme, we can uh, maximize the tax. So the philosophy of uh, the government is the following, that intuitively we can say that in an ideal society, nobody will object to wealth redistribution and taxation as long as the total utility after the action of the government is no less than it was before the action uh, of the government. Uh, but on the other hand, if the total utility is reduced 
to a level that was before its original level, then there will be a revolution and the government will be uh, forced out. Uh, so that's the line that we're taking. And of course, in reality, things are more complicated than that. But this one gives a feeling for how much taxation the government can get away with. Uh, namely, the principle is that people will shrug their shoulders if there's some wealth redistribution. And as long as the total utility uh, remains the same or uh, improves, uh, if, uh, if it decreases, uh, then they'll uh, say that things aren't uh, working uh, uh, properly. So we can check that for any redistribution preserving the original total utility, the maximum taxes uh, ex extracted when the redistribution is an equal distribution, again, uh, between the uh, two workers. So this is essentially an extension of the idea that we looked at a moment ago. Uh, even when we extract tax, the optimal uh, way of extracting tax is to, uh, under the assumptions that we've made, is to equalize the uh, remaining uh, uh, incomes. And uh, to see this, uh, again, it's a very simple argument, but a little bit more complicated than the previous one. So we let T be the tax, and let that be some function of R uh, for a fixed value of X and Y. And this uh, T is the function of R is defined by the condition that the total utility after tax, so that's U of R uh, plus U of X uh, plus Y minus R minus T is equal to the uh, original utility. And so if you differentiate that, then, well, remember, we want to find well, we want to treat t as a function of r, and we want to find the maximum value of t. So we pick out a term involving the derivative uh, of t. And then if we rearrange that, then we get a formula for the derivative, which is given uh, above. And then so t is maximized uh, if we uh, set the numerator equal to 0. So that gives a condition on these two marginal utilities. But once again, the marginal utility is invertible, so that gives r is equal to 1 half x plus y minus t. Uh, and then you can work out the corresponding value for the other worker, and it turns out to be the same. So therefore, you get an equal distribution for the, uh, the two workers. Uh, you want to check, of course, that this is really a maximum, but you can uh, easily work out that uh, the uh, second derivative is, uh, is negative at the, uh, at the optimal uh, value. So in conclusion, the uh, maximum taxes extracted in the process of income redistribution, if there's an equal distribution of the wealth uh, such that uh, u of, uh, of r times 2 is equal to u of x plus u of y, and then the optimal tax is given by uh, the sum of the two original incomes minus uh, twice the uh, distribution uh, made to uh, each of the uh, workers. Now, Yes. The standard objection here is that because C works, that pays the uh, productivity, marginal productivity of the labor. So uh, if, if you tax, then, then there's going to be a, a less productive worker because they're, they're not going to be, they're going to be receiving less, they're going to uh, output a less productive uh, marginal uh, uh, labor. And, and therefore, the total uh, income is going to be different than it was before. Before the tax for you. Yes. Uh, well, this, this is certainly true, and one should take it into consideration. But in an ideal society, this doesn't apply. I mean, people will work as hard as they can, uh, and then will share. Well, uh, well uh, I mean, that's a political statement, and that's not the assumption that I'm making. Okay. Well, the, the point is the two incomes are given in this model. Uh, we're not making a, a model for the behavior of the people under, under, under labor. Yeah. So, so y yes, I mean, one, in, a, in, a, in a more risk, realistic version of the model, there are many factors that need to be taken into consideration. But, uh, but that's not quite the, 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 the point here. Uh, uh, <coughs> 
what we need to do is get a feeling for what the redistribution actually looks like. Uh, so, uh, well, one can work things out rather explicitly in the case of logarithmic utility, as one knows in many problems in finance. So we'll look at that case. Um, so we'll let the utility function be log of x. And then the optimal redistribution level uh, r is then given by twice log r is equal to log x plus log y. And uh, you can do the calculation in your head, and that gives the, uh, that r, the amount given to a given worker, is given by the square root of, uh, uh, of x, y. Uh, so the amount distributed to each of the workers is given by the geometric mean of the uh, two original uh, incomes. And so what this means is that the optimal tax is given by the difference uh, b between x plus y and minus uh, twice the square root of x, y. Or if you look on a, on a per capita basis, then you divide by two. And so you see that the tax uh, attributable uh, in a general way to each of the two workers is given by half x plus y minus the square root of x, y. So that's the difference between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean. And uh, this is, of course, strictly positive if x is greater than uh, y. Uh, we know it has to be positive from the general assumptions of the concavity of the utility functions that, that we've made. Uh, but one sees that in this particular example, uh, it works out uh, to a rather uh, simple uh, formula. Uh, to get a feeling for the numbers, we can look at a simple uh, numerical example. So. Uh, so we'll suppose that x is given by $9 and y is given by uh, uh, $4. If you want to make it more realistic, then you can, each, uh, you can multiply each of these numbers by 10,000. And since 10,000 is a perfect square, uh, then th things work out uh, with more or less the same numbers multiplied times uh, <coughs> appropriate uh, factors. So we find that the total income is $13. Uh, but twice the geometric mean is given uh, by uh, $12. So, uh, so the difference between these two is uh, $1. Uh, so one finds that the uh, distribution to each worker is $6 uh, after wealth redistribution, and the per capita tax taken is, uh, is half of a dollar. <laughs> uh, so you see that the uh, higher earner is taxed altogether, that's to say, wealth redistribution plus the, as it were, income tax that goes purely to, to the government uh, at around 33%. And the lower earner gets a substantial boost, about 50% of his uh, original uh, income. So the government collects about one third of the amount that is redistributed. So overall, the, uh, the result is, is not, uh, not an unreasonable one, and in fact is uh, something you know, similar to what we uh, observe in, uh, in certain versions of society. If we assume that the redistributed wealth really is redistributed and is not uh, lost in uh, uh, inefficiencies. Uh, one can easily work at, out other examples and one can get a feeling for the uh, numbers uh, involved. Well, now let me turn to thermodynamics. So far I've stuck purely to financial considerations, but uh, uh, where does all of this uh, uh, come from? Uh, well, let me dig digress slightly on classical thermodynamics. So uh, many of you will have studied it at university. So it's a very interesting subject. It has an interesting history stretching back to early parts of the 19th century. And it remains a key branch of modern physics and has numerous practical uh, engineering applications uh, as well. Now. Uh, there are many different presentations of thermodynamics, and mathematicians typically find the subject bewildering because it's very difficult to get a clear statement of what the assumptions are and what the results are. <laughs> uh, but a typical formulation of the subject introduces uh, so-called extensive variables. So these have names like entropy, energy, volume, and particle number, or mole number. Uh, and then another set of variables called intensive variables, and these are variables such as temperature, pressure, and uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, potential. And we're dealing with substances in equilibrium, so ordinary states of matter that are fairly tangible, gases, solids, liquids uh, of different types. Uh, and the substance is defined by a so-called fundamental equation, uh, which specifies one of the extensive uh, variables, usually the energy or the entropy, 
in terms of uh, the, the others. Uh, so in what follows, it'll turn out to be convenient to work with the uh, so-called entropy representation, uh, in which the entropy is specified as a function of the energy and the volume and the mole numbers. Now one can work with other representations, but this is the representation that has the most directly uh, direct analog with, uh, uh, with uh, problems arising in financial economics. Uh, so the fundamental equation takes the following form. So we'll use the sort of slightly archaic notation of the physicists, and they'll say the entropy S is given by some function, which is also called S. This is the way that physicists do mathematics. Mathematicians find this very irritating, and I can understand why. Uh, but nevertheless, it's well established in the literature, so there's no point in, in avoiding it. It works. So we'll say S is given by some function S of E, V, and the various uh, uh, mole numbers. So here E is the energy, V is the volume, and N1 and N2 and so on denote the number of moles of the various constituents of the, uh, of the substance. Uh, now there's one crucial property that S has to satisfy. It has to be homogeneous of degree one. Uh, this is what is meant by extensive. So this means if we multiply E, multiply the total energy by lambda, let's say, the total volume by lambda, each of the mole numbers by uh, lambda, then this has the effect of multiplying the uh, entropy uh, by lambda. And you can see why it's called extensive. It means that if you have uh, two batches of the substance, uh, then the total entropy of the two batches will be twice the entropy uh, of one batch of the uh, substance, uh, uh, and so on. Now the intensive variables uh, are defined by uh, various uh, partial derivatives. They are, uh, as it were, marginal uh, entropies uh, with respect to the various uh, extensive uh, variables. Now, uh, owing to a long tradition stretching back 200 years, the conventions uh, vary slightly from variable to variable about how these uh, intensive quantities are defined. So the temperature, for example, as a function of the energy, the volume, and the mole numbers is defined by the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. <laughs> uh, but it's one over the temperature, that's what you get. <laughs> And then the, the pressure is defined by taking the derivative with respect to the volume, but that gives you the pressure divided by the temperature. So that's how pressure is defined. There is no sort of external definition of pressure. This is the definition of pressure. And then the chemical potential is defined similarly when you take the derivative with respect to the mole numbers, but there's a minus sign. Now it takes, use, it takes some time to get used to these various conventions and so on and so forth. And, uh, the virtue of the conventions is that they correspond to quantities that are measurable in the laboratory, and since there's a long tradition in the literature, uh, one might as well uh, stick with the conventions, although they don't make the mathematical exposition of the subject uh, uh, easy. Uh, the key point is that the fundamental equation carries all the thermodynamic information about this uh, system under consideration. No other assumptions are required other than the statement of what the fundamental equation is, and then you've defined your uh, uh, substance. Uh, now, motivated by tradition, there's a slight tendency for physicists to jump directly into the deep end of the subject, introducing uh, functions of multiple variables without considering the abstractions of simplified uh, versions of the theory. So allowing for that, uh, we can define a simple substance as one for which all of the extensive variables are fixed apart from the energy uh, and the entropy. The point is that the energy and the entropy are quantities that are defined for any kind of substance, whereas the others vary depending on the nature and the structure, whether it's chemical or electronic or nuclear and so on and so forth. Huh? So we fix the volume and the mole numbers and treat the energy as the sole extensive variable uh, characterizing the state of the system. So then the function S defined by S of E, again using ph physicist notation, defines a simple uh, substance. Now the temperature as a as a function of the given value of the energy is defined by the derivative of E is equal to one over T. Uh, and now we add some additional assumptions, or essentially axioms to the thermodynamics. We assume that the energy and the temperature are both strictly positive, and that the unattainable so-called absolute zero of a temperature results uh, in the limit as the energy goes to uh, the zero. Now physicists find this confusing, but mathematicians don't have any problem with it. Uh, the energy is always strictly positive, but nevertheless the, uh, the limit as the energy goes to zero, the temperature is zero, and that's what we mean by uh, uh, absolute uh, uh, zero. Uh, we also assume that the temperature increases as the energy 
increases and the temperature is unbounded. So if you put a pot of water on the stove and you, you add more energy from the flame, then uh, the water uh, gets uh, hotter. And we assume that it's unbounded. So what does this mean? This means that the derivative of the temperature with respect to the energy is positive, and the limit is the energy goes to infinity uh, of the temperature as a function of the energy is infinite. Uh, but this has an immediate implication because remember that the derivative of the energy, uh, the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy is one divided by the temperature. So if you take the second derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy, you get minus the derivative of the temperature with respect to the energy divided by the square of the temperature. But if the first derivative of the temperature with respect to the energy is positive, that implies that the entropy function is concave. So these arguments over the last five, five minutes or so have been uh, leading you up to the, the sort of fundamental fact that the uh, entropy is a concave function of the, uh, uh, of the energy. And this all uh, follows from very general and very simple uh, uh, physical uh, uh, principles. And furthermore, you can see that the fact that the limit <coughs> as the energy goes to infinity of the temperature is infinite, uh, that implies that the limit as the energy goes to infinity of the first derivative uh, of the entropy uh, is zero. And furthermore, if you take the limit as the energy goes to zero of the temperature, this implies that the limit as the energy goes to zero of the first derivative of the energy is infinite. So all together, we see that the first derivative of the entropy is positive, the second derivative of the entropy is negative, uh, the, the limit as e goes to infinity of the marginal entropy is zero, and the limit as e goes to zero of the marginal entropy is infinite. Uh, so in fact, these are exactly the conditions of a standard uh, uh, utility function. <laughs> so this is the, the point. It comes as a surprise. Uh, if you take thermodynamic theory and you strip away uh, uh, a lot of the complications of the volume and the mole numbers and so on and so forth and come down to the basic variables, uh, then you're left with uh, a definition for the entropy that uh, satisfies the, uh, uh, the conditions that we're familiar with in uh, uh, utility uh, theory. So what this means is, very roughly speaking, here I'm speaking in generalities, but what this means is that any theorem in the theory of classical thermodynamics translates into a result in financial economics. Uh, now whether such a result is of interest or not depends on the details of the context, but since thermodynamic theory is highly developed and has a 200 year old history and so forth, it certainly makes sense to attempt to uh, apply it in this, sphere, in this sphere. Apply in the sense of taking some result that you understand in thermodynamics and move it over into finance and see what the implications are. So here are one or two simple examples. So what about logarithmic utility? Uh, does that have a thermodynamic analogy? Uh, does it correspond to uh, some kind of simple system? And the answer is yes. So the simple substance defined by a fundamental of the equation, uh, equation of the form S of E is equal to uh, A log E plus B, where A and B are constants. That's well known to physicists. This is what is called an ideal monatomic gas. Uh, so of course there are many applications and it's very simple and uh, even in high school most of you learn about PV is equal to NRT and ex expressions like that. That's all part of the theory of the uh, ideal uh, uh, monotonic uh, gas. Now this is not the way that physicists usually present the subject since the theory of convex analysis is not normally the starting point for the development of classical thermodynamics. But it certainly makes sense to present the subject this way. And if you were to start all over again, you know, this is a kind of logical way of developing the subject, uh, treating the entropy as a concave function satisfying certain uh, asymptotic uh, uh, properties. Well, let me conclude with a few remarks about uh, equilibrium. Uh, so now consider the situation where we have two samples of an ideal monatomic gas of equal volume and mole number. Uh, in insulated uh, containers. So we have uh, container one and container two. And suppose initially the first sample is at some temperature T1, and the second sample is at some temperature uh, T2, and T1 is greater than T2. Uh, then if we put the two containers into contact and remove the insulating wall uh, uh, in between them, then experience 
shows that heat will flow from the hotter one to the colder one, and eventually they'll equilibrate at a temperature, which is the average of the two uh, original temperatures. Everybody's had that experience where you have one room in your house where the air conditioning has been on, another room in your house where the air conditioning has been off. You open the door uh, between them, and then uh, after a few moments, the uh, the hot room cools off and the cool room gets a little bit warmer and then they're at some a common temperature, which is the average of the two original uh, uh, temperatures. Uh, now, this example can be pursued a little bit further. You see, in the case of an ideal monatomic gas, then the temperature is proportional to the, uh, to the energy. Uh, that can easily be worked out if you start with the fundamental equation and the definition of the, uh, of the temperature. So suppose that the initial energies of these two containers are x and y. Here I'm using the same notation that I used earlier in the financial example just to bring home the, the parallel. Uh, then if you simply put the two containers in contact with one another, or, or like opening the door between the two rooms, uh, then after a time, uh, energy will flow from one room to the next, and then the equilibrium energy will be uh, uh, one half x plus uh, y. Uh, in other words, the two rooms have the same amount of energy, and it's equal to the average of the energies of the two rooms before uh, you open uh, the door. Uh, but it's well known in the theory of thermodynamics, and this goes back you know, to the work of Carnot and others you know, in the uh, earlier part of the 19th century, uh, that, uh, that two such containers can be brought into equilibrium adiabatically, uh, that's to say, without changing the total entropy of the system. So such transformations are called reversible by physicists. Uh, that's because they're reversible. And in the case of an adiabatically achieved uh, equilibrium, uh, the resulting common temperature uh, is lower, uh, it's colder. And, uh, and work, uh, that's to say useful energy, uh, can be extracted from the system. By useful energy, I mean energy that can be used to lift a weight or to push a, a piston uh, in an engine. <laughs> Uh, so you can use the thermodynamic theory to work out the maximum amount of useful work that can be extracted from a pair of ideal monatomic gas samples at different temperatures by bringing them into equilibrium by adiabatic transformations. And this is given by, well, it's the same formula we were considering earlier. It's the uh, uh, x plus y minus twice the square root of, uh, of xy. Uh, so it turns out then that the extraction of useful work from a thermodynamic system that is out of equilibrium, like two gas samples uh, at different uh, temperatures, uh, is precisely analogous to the extraction of maximal tax uh, through uh, wealth uh, redistribution. Uh, the, the mathematics of the two uh, subjects is uh, completely parallel. And in fact, that's how the earlier results were obtained by essentially following through the thermodynamic analogy. Okay. I'll stop at this point. Thank you.